This Bible didn't have any tabs in it earlier. It must have took me about five minutes to figure out where in the world Nahum was. <laughs> all right, as we stated in the bulletin, this is really one of the great verses in all of the scripture. One of the greatest verses in all of the Bible. Nahum declares to us in verse 7 of chapter 1, The Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. And again, Yahweh is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows, he knows those who trust in him. This verse spoke to me so greatly, so deeply. It so touched my heart the very first time I read it. I remember it must have been a, nearly 10 years ago now, because Christian was just a little baby. And we were living in Ontario the first time, uh, sometime around 2003 or 4. In fact, we might have just moved into Norwalk for that matter. And I was going through the Minor Prophets and came to Nahum. And my goodness, that verse just... just just so brightly shines out from the pages of Scripture. As you read through Nahum, it's not too long before you get to that verse 7. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And he's so good to us, he's a stronghold that whenever we face trouble, we can run to him and hide. And he will protect us. He will keep us. And he knows each and every one of us. Oh, the Lord is so good. And this verse so touched me as I read it those near 10 years ago that I sought to, to really put it to music. And if you came to Vacation Bible School, you, you sang with the kids, He is a stronghold in day of trouble, and he knows those, this is Jonathan Davis' favorite part, and he knows those who trust in him. And then it goes on to how the Lord is good, the Lord is good. And I sought to do that because I wanted my kids to know this verse. I wanted it to be something I could remember all the time. Whenever I faced turmoil and difficulty and trial, I wanted something to be able to, to be able to remember this verse by. And what better way than to set it to music? Music is so easily remembered in the heart and by the mind. And so the Lord is good. And it has been a verse that has meant so much to me over the years. Because I have seen in my life, the Lord is good to me. And I imagine those of you here, in fact I know it. As you have all given testimony so very publicly in this church and in other places of how the Lord has been good to you. It hasn't always been easy. That's why, thank goodness, he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. That's really why he is so good. Because we can run to him and know that we are protected and kept by him and by his love. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Now, before we make personal application of how the Lord has been good to us. You may find it really a strange verse as Nahum declares it here. In fact, let's begin reading from verse 1 to sort of get the idea of where this verse comes into play in Nahum's life and ministry. Verse 1 declares, The burden against Nineveh. Oh, right away, that tells us this is the sequel to Jonah. See, Jonah, he went to Nineveh about 150 years before Nahum prophesied. So Jonah is 150 years ago, and we know his story. He went to Nineveh. He didn't want to. He was the reluctant prophet. In fact, he had other ideas until the Lord explained to him his will more clearly. <laughs> and then uh, Jonah finally did get to Nineveh, and he declared that Nineveh was going down. Judgment Day was just 40 days away, and that city repented. And we've talked about Jonah, how that was really his greatest fear, because he knew how good the Lord was and how slow to anger and how he's so full of loving kindness and grace. And Jonah was afraid that if they repented, even though they had not been given a gospel of grace. Remember, Jonah was not sent to give them a message of, if you repent, God will be gracious. That wasn't part of the deal. It was simply 40 days and you're done, for, you're done for. You're through. It's over. Judgment. You're overthrown, as he declared. But they did repent to Jonah's great dismay. <laughs> the greatest revival in history, and the evangelist was so upset about it. <laughs> Imagine that. And so 150 years go by, and those people who once repented, 
the king down to the lowest peasant. Those people have long since passed. And now their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are on the scene. And they are an unrepentant and rebellious people. And so Nahum, 150 years later, he has a burden against Nineveh. Jonah wanted to trade places with Nahum. Oh, Lord, give me the burden. <laughs> Lord, give me the burden against Nineveh. Let, let me tell them they're going down and there's no hope for them any longer. But Nahum was the one who was given this. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. Now, before we get much further, you'll notice as you go through the book, we're only going to really look at one verse this evening, verse 7. But as you go through the book, Nahum never goes to Nineveh. Nahum doesn't mail this prophecy out to Nineveh. He, he never bothers to explain to Nineveh what the Lord has burdened him with. That wasn't his calling. See, Nineveh has reached the end of God's mercy, if you will. Nineveh's judgment is certain it is coming. Nahum has been sent to comfort God's people who are being harassed, who are being persecuted, who are being threatened by Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. Nahum speaks to God's people who are threatened by the enemy. And he speaks to them that God has watched out for you. God sees your cry. He sees your fears. And he sees your enemy. And God is going to wipe out your enemy. God is going to protect you, his people. Nahum, his name means comforter. He was sent to comfort God's people by declaring to them the destruction of of their enemy and the victory that was secured to them in and by the Lord their God. Because, verse 2 declares, God is jealous and Yahweh avenges. He's not jealous like I am. He's not jealous like we can be. We, we tend to be jealous for all the wrong reasons, for selfish reasons, because we don't want to lose something, so I'm very jealous of it. You know, you'll, you'll hear, you'll hear uh, people be jealous about something that somebody else has, and they don't have it, and that sort of a thing. God is not jealous like that because he is all-sufficient in and of himself. He is self-sufficient. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are completely and fully satisfied in and of themselves. They need nothing. They don't need you or me to give them anything. God doesn't need anything. So there's no reason that he should be jealous because Martha has something and he wishes he had it. That's not the way God works. There's nothing in God to be selfish about because he has all things in and of himself. God is jealous on a whole different plane. When we read this word, we must not read it with the sense that we might understand it with people. God is jealous for us. God wants us to be blessed by him. And God is grieved when sin tears up our life. When the enemy comes in like a roaring lion to devour our lives. When we go through trials and turmoils and tribulations, God is jealous for us. Because his heart breaks for us. He wants the best for us. And when the enemy comes against God's people, when the enemy thinks they can stand against us, when the enemy smirks and taunts us in the courtroom, when the enemy comes against us under the name of friend and yet betrays us. When the enemy marches against God's church or against God's people. When the enemy seeks to hurt us, God is jealous for our well-being. See, God is completely selfless, but he's also completely full of love for his people. And that love burns with a righteous indignation when those that he loves are harmed and threatened by those who would dare come against his people. And so God is jealous and Yahweh avenges. That's why the scripture tells us, both in Old and New Testament, if you belong to the Lord God, then don't seek to get revenge. You know, on ABC there was a show, I think it's still going for its second season, it's called Revenge. And I imagine the plot is all about some girl getting revenge on everybody who's wronged her. But as Christians, we're called to be different. See, if Christian, then different. And the Lord tells us, look, I see you and your need. I see you and your enemies. I see you when you are in trouble. Will you trust me in my way and in my will and in my time to take care of that person against those people who have sought to do you harm or who have threatened you to hurt you? God says, 
I will repay. Vengeance is mine. You just trust in me. And sometimes that can be very difficult because we want to get our pound of flesh. We want to get even Stephen. We want to make it right. And yet we are called to allow the Lord to take care of that for us. So Yahweh avenges. Yahweh avenges and is furious. Sometimes don't we think that God doesn't care? <laughs> we're going through so much trouble. People are coming after us and harming us and hurting us. And we're going through this, that, and the other thing. And it just seems like, God, don't you even care? And the Lord wants us to know he is furious at our plight. He is furious against those who would lift up their heel against us. He is furious against our enemies. He has an emotional response against those who would seek to do you harm. When you fall into trouble at the hands of another, it infuriates your heavenly father. He does have an emotional response because he does care. The scripture tells us plainly, does it not? Cast your care upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. And so he wants us to just trust him with that. Casting your care upon him is another way of saying, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You cast that care my way. You, you don't take care of yourself, you let me deal with it. The Lord will deal with it. The, the Lord is righteous, he is just. Now, the wheels of his justice, they, they tend to, 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 to grind very slowly, but they also grind very finely. <laughs> the Lord does what he's going to do. It may not be on my time clock, on my schedule. Lord, I need this done right now. I need this done within the next few days. I need this done by January 24. And yet the Lord says, look, you just trust in me. Have patience in tribulation. Rejoice in hope, as Paul would say. The Lord will. Do you need to underline that? Do you doubt that? That the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries? Oh, his adversaries? Who was he talking about? I thought he was talking about my enemy. Oh, you mean if I have an enemy, then the Lord has an enemy too? My enemies, my adversaries are his adversaries. Do you see how the Lord takes ownership of your problem? I will take care of my adversaries, those who dare come against you, because you are my people. And so those who would come against my people, they are no friend of mine. They are my adversary as well. And notice, he reserves wrath for his enemies. He's got it stored up and piled. He has it all kept up, just waiting for the dam to break in his good and proper time. See, our problem really is this. Yes, we get angry, and we get furious, and we're glad here we read the Lord is angry and furious. But the other side of the Lord's nature that we tend not to have so much of is the part that is very merciful and slow to anger. And so the Lord sometimes is also working in other people's lives when we wish he would just wipe them out. <laughs> you know? The Lord has a, a bigger plan. It's beyond just our life. He'll take care of it. It's not that he's going to let it slide, your injustice, that which was done against you. He's not going to let it slide. But so often he sees a far greater and bigger picture. And he also is filled with much more mercy than you and I tend to be. Yahweh is slow to anger. Now that's always really the problem, isn't it? Why can't he just be quick-tempered? Why can't he just fly off the handle and take care of every problem I have right this second? Well, he's slow to anger, and I suppose he desires to teach us patience in that. That we should be, you know, father like son, father like daughter, that we should be like our Heavenly Father. And so if he's slow to anger, if he is slow to wipe out his enemies, well, I suppose isn't that what Jesus taught? Turn the other cheek, pray for your enemies, pray for those who spitefully use you and abuse you. Jesus said it's real easy to love your friends because they love you too. The real trick, the real spiritual work takes place when you begin to love those who hate you. Love those who use you and abuse you and who wrong you. To love your enemies. And that can be such a difficult thing. And yet the Lord shows us how he is very patient and he wants us to work to follow after that. He wants us to develop that spiritual work in our lives that we would be patient. And I suppose the more patient we get, maybe the more merciful we might become. Maybe the more loving we might begin to be.
And it can be so difficult sometimes. Because we really just can be so angry that we want others to fall. We want others to be wiped out. And though God promises his justice will flow, he also wants us to learn something about the other side of his nature. That he is love. Now, the Lord is slow to anger, but he's also great in power. You see, he only gives so much time to the sinner to repent. For the rebel to make himself right with him. He only gives so much time until finally he says, the time is up. You recall when he talked to Abraham there in uh, Genesis, the early chapters. He told Abraham, look around you, I'm going to give you all this land, but not yet. In about 400 years, your, your descendants will return here, and I will give it to them at that time. But right now, the people who live here, their iniquity, their sin, it's not yet complete. They haven't yet pushed me over the limit. Now, 400 years later, Joshua would lead them into the promised land, and what was the Lord's command? Wipe them out, man, woman, child, and beast. Let nothing live. Remember, Jericho was the city that was completely given over to the Lord and nothing was allowed to live nor to be taken as plunder. Everything was to be wiped out, to be killed, and to be burned. That's what would happen later. But back in Abraham's day, their sin is not yet complete. My mercy is still working with them. My spirit is still striving with them. But as we read about in Genesis 6, my spirit shall not always strive with man. It finally comes to its conclusion, its end. That's why today is the day of salvation. You don't put it off, because eventually you come to the end where the day of salvation has passed and the day of judgment has come. So the Lord, yeah, he's slow to anger. Oh, but he's great in power. And that judgment finally does fall, and the greatness of his power is seen. Sodom and Gomorrah was so prosperous and such a great, mighty, and amazing city, just like Nineveh was, just like Babylon was. And yet, when the time finally came, when the Lord's mercy came to its, its fullness... When their sin finally pushed God over the edge, the destruction was complete. It was, there was nothing left after, afterwards. And so, yeah, he's slow to anger, but he's great in power, and we must rest in that. And he will not at all acquit the wicked. Hey, if somebody is wicked, and they will not repent, they will not turn to the Lord, they will not be acquitted in God's court. See, you come to the Lord through Jesus Christ... And though you may be wicked, you know, though you are an unrighteous person, you throw yourself on the, the, uh, the mercy seat of Jesus Christ, if you will. There in the courtroom of the Heavenly Father. And there your sins are dealt with by the, the blood of Christ. But outside of that, you are not acquitted of your sin nor of your wickedness. There comes a final day where the judgment must fall. <coughs> now... The Lord has his way. Sometimes we think the world has their way. Sometimes we think nothing's ever going to go the right way. You know, we try to hang on to Romans 8, 28, where, you know, for those who are chosen, for those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to his purpose, everything is working out together for good and for his glory. And yet sometimes we begin to doubt that. And Nahum reminds God's people, Yahweh has his way. In the whirlwind and the storm, when you look out and see chaos, and God must not be in control. Nahum says he's in absolute control because he has authority over the chaos. The Lord has his way, and the clouds are but the dust of his feet. You, you, you see a storm brewing in your life? You, you see chaos looming? You, you see uh, this just debris flying, dust everywhere, and it looks like nothing is going right? God has his way. Remember what Joseph told his brothers when they thought he would take his vengeance upon them because they had thrown him into a pit and sold him into slavery. 20 years go by and they find out he's the prince of Egypt. And they're afraid of Joseph. And what does he say? He understood the heart of God. And we learn something about God from Joseph's words. What you meant for evil, what you meant to bring chaos into my life and trouble upon me, God meant it for good. So when you look around your life and you see the storm, you see the chaos, you see the dust billowing up around you, know that God, the Lord, Yahweh, your Savior, has his way. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. Notice the great power of God here. And the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt and the earth heaves at its presence. 
Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. When God moves, people feel it. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Nineveh, you better watch out. Nineveh, you're the enemy of God's people, as you were the enemy of God himself. God is about to move. He's slow to anger, but he's great in power. And so what does Nahum say after saying all of this? To God's people, the Lord is good to you. The Lord sees what you're going through. He has not been blind to your trouble. He has not been ignorant of your heartaches. The Lord is good, and he will move on your behalf. Yahweh is good. And in our lives, we can look around and, and see how, if we're honest with ourselves, none of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve the goodness of the Lord. And yet Jesus came. He became a man. He went to the cross, and he died because God so loved the world. And through Christ, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from his Father, the Father of lights. It, the, the blessings that you have in your life come from the Lord because he's good. He's good. He's good. He is a blessing God. The Bible even tells me, if I have found a good wife, that you have obtained grace from the Lord. It is the Lord who has blessed you with that grace good and wonderful woman. The, the children that we so often complain about because they don't behave. <laughs> the Lord says, oh man, you are blessed if you have children. They are a heritage from the Lord. Sometimes we argue with God about that, but it's awful true, isn't it? And so the Lord blesses us. The Lord is good to us. And so often we doubt that goodness because we have to go through a trial. And yet, if we would just acknowledge him, we would realize he is right there going through that trial with us because he's good. What did David say there in the 23rd Psalm? Okay, I go through the valley of the shadow of death, but I don't fear evil. I'm not worried about what's going to happen to me. Whatever it is, whether I'm a martyr marching into the lion's den or whether I'm just a person like you and me going through life and just facing the common troubles of the world. I will fear no evil because you're with me. And your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You're with me. And no matter what comes, no matter what happens, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever because he's good. God made sure that this life, with all of its sin and problems, would never be the best we could ever hope for. He made sure that heaven awaits us. Jesus paid the price to make sure that this life would never be as good as it can be. It would only be as bad as it could be because heaven awaits us in the future. No matter how good this life is down here, it pales in comparison with the glory that awaits us in the presence of the Lord in his heaven. It pales. The best day we've ever had down here is only the foretaste of what heaven will be like. And so the Lord, he wants us to know that he is good. He desires to bless us. And if we look around and count our blessings, we will see that he is good to us. He has brought us salvation. He has brought us good news because instead of destruction in hell, we have hope in heaven. And the Lord, he is a stronghold in day of trouble. He knows that this life is hard. The Bible never makes a, you know, it's, it's very open and honest about the difficulties of this life. And it says, hey, everybody has troubles. There is nothing that we face as Christians that our, that our uh, contemporaries in the world don't also face. There are troubles that are just common to man. The difference is with the Lord, we have a stronghold of hope. We have a stronghold in the day of trouble. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, the Lord, his name, it's like a strong tower. And the righteous, they run into it and they find safety and security. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. The intimacy of God's relationship with you and me. Remember what Jesus said? He says, why do you worry? Don't you know that God loves you and he desires to take care of you? He desires to provide for your needs. He knows the very number of the hairs on your head. He knows everything about you to the minutest detail. And not just the outward appearance. God knows and searches your heart. He knows the heartaches. The heartbreaks. 
He knows the sufferings and the trials and the secret pains. He knows that which we don't share with anybody else. He knows those who are his. He knows us closely and intimately, and he loves us anyway. You know, so often we keep certain things in our heart. We keep certain things private and secret because we're afraid. If I was to let somebody know about that, they wouldn't like me. They wouldn't love me. I, I got to hide that. I got to keep that. And so sometimes, even with our closest friends and family, we still wear a certain mask. Because we want them to see the best. We don't want them to see the ugly. We don't want them to see that which is sinful, that which is shameful. And yet the Lord, he knows all those things. And yet still loves us. He still deeply cares about us, deeply interested in us. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are his great masterpiece, his favorite hobby. And he loves to work on us and to work in us. And he never gives up on us. Because we're his favorite he, we, we, he loves us, and we're his masterpiece. I look in the mirror, and I don't see that, but he does, because he sees Christ in me, the hope of glory, and he sees that in you, too. And we need to understand, no matter what we go through, and especially in the hard times, we must never forget, just as Nahum was sent to God's people back in this ancient day, because they were under threat of destruction by Assyria, the enemy loomed over them, sought to destroy them. The enemy was all around them. And yet Nahum came to them with this word. And the Lord comes to you today with the same word. No matter what surrounds your life, no matter how afraid you might be, the Lord is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows you. And he knows what you need. And he knows what he has to do to take care of you. And he has taken the responsibility upon himself to see you through. Because he desires to complete the good work that he started in your life. And he will see it through until the day of Christ Jesus. He has assured us. Let, us. let us pray And as we prepare for communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful verse that speaks of your goodness and of your strength. And Lord, of your desire to be so close and intimate with us. Heavenly Father, might this word bless us this evening and might we take it with us as we go through the week. In Jesus' name, amen. And of course, as the pastor and the Christian will pass out the communion elements, we remember, help grandpa? We remember how the Lord, that evening, as he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples, he, he desired to remember with them what the Lord had done in the past. And yet he said, but I also want to make a new covenant with you. Do you guys remember the Passover where the lamb was slain and the blood was put on the threshold? And then the lamb was, was partaken of and they, they gathered together and feasted around that lamb. Jesus said, I'm the lamb of God. Here's my blood. Here's my body broken for you. And whenever you take of the, the bread and the wine, remember that I died for your sins. partake of the fruit of the vine. We remember his blood was shed for us. And the bread, of course, reminds us that his body was broken, but he went willingly to the cross that we might be with him forever.
Because he 